Okay, so chapter seven, introduction to hypothesis testing. So now we're transitioning the course. Now we're heading into the inferential statistics side of the course. Inferential statistics. This is where the people make the big bucks, okay? So you, inferential statistics, pretty big deal. Now, what does it mean? Okay, going back to the first day of class, this is using a sample to draw conclusions about a population. Why is this a very important topic? Okay, let me try to shed a little bit of light on why this is a big deal. If I wanted to know a characteristic about the population, I've got two options, right? One, I go out and I ask everybody in the population, how, you know, how do they feel about this topic or or do they like ice cream? Whatever the question might be, okay? Or I, I study this person and say, okay, do they respond well to this treatment, a, a type of drug? Maybe they're trying to um, do a statistical study um, on experimental drug that helps out with the side effects for COVID-19 or whatever, okay? So... You can either go out and test everybody, which would take a lot of time and a whole lot of money, a lot more than a couple billion dollars. Or you can go out and you can get the same information from a random sample, okay? That's where the power lies in inferential statistics. We can get the same information from a small amount of data, okay? small compared with going out and sampling everybody, all right? So very, very powerful. Why is it powerful? Inferential statistic is used to make informed decisions about so it's all about trying to make an intelligent and educated decision, right? We're trying to make the best decision possible. It could be dealing with medicine, so some new medicine, okay? So in the medical field, statistics is extremely important. No real research is done without statistics. There has to be data backing. You can't just be like, well, this drug just makes me feel so good, right? Warm and fuzzy inside, that doesn't work. There has to be statistical evidence proving that the medication does better for you than someone who's not doing the medication. And by the end of chapter 8, we will know how to run the statistical st testing that the drug companies use to validate their drugs and get them through FDA processing and all that and make sure that they're safe. Um, other things, you could have treatments and psychology, the best practices for psychology, definitely a ton of statistics in that realm there. Um, marketing. Marketing strategies. Did, did the money that you just blew in all of your Facebook ads, did it really increase your business revenue? Or was the cost more than how much... Um, you got uh, from that increase in revenue. So you can do a before and after test, you know. Um, so there's all sorts of ways that we can use statistics to not just make a, well, my gut tells me I should do this, right? Your gut is good when you're running a small business. Say you've only got one store, all right? But when you're talking about businesses like Walmart, where 
if they're off by a penny on their, you know, a product that they're producing 10 million times, that is a lot of money, okay? So they are trying to get down to the penny what they can get away with, okay? So so every cent counts in how they determine what price to put things at where, you know, the the free market kind of gives us a way to be price efficient, all right? So statistics helps us make these informed decisions. Did we mark it too high and then all of a sudden, well, golly, we're not selling as much and we're making less revenue even though we've got it priced up higher. So maybe we should cut back on price to get that sweet spot, the su supply and demand. Okay, so a hypothesis test. We're going to use hypothesis test for the rest of the semester, so it's very important that you understand what hypothesis testing is. This is a process that is used, so, so it uses a sample statistics to make a claim about the value of a population parameter. All right? So we go out, we get a sample, we get some X bar, and we, from this X bar, from that sample, we say, you know, we claim that the true mean is equal to something, okay? Or greater than or less than, whatever it is. A statement about the population parameter, like a mean, mu, that's a population parameter. A X bar, that's a sample statistic, okay? This is a statistical hypothesis. Hypothesis, we're making some claim, all right? And we're gonna test to see if it's true. So a claim is made. Here's our claim. Cell phone company claims that the main life of a battery for some particular model is more than eight hours, okay? So the claim is that the battery for a particular model is more than eight hours. That's great because guess what? With my cell phone, it's one of the older versions and uh, all I have to do is play on it for about 30 minutes and my battery drops down super fast. So I think it's about time I get a new phone, right? So uh, don't update your phone, otherwise you'll lose your battery life, huh? Now, here's the claim. My model for this phone is going to be more than eight hours, all right? Now, to do a hypothesis test, we are going to form two hypotheses. Form two hypotheses. One of the hypotheses represents the claim. Here my claim is that the model lasts for more than eight hours battery life. The second hypothesis is its complement. You guys remember what complement means? The complement, this is the opposite, okay? It's the exact opposite. So if I know that the claim is true, then what do I know about the opposite claim? If the claim is true, then the complement is false. This has got to be false, okay? Now it works both ways. If the claim is false, then the opposite has to be true, right? So I don't want you to think that the claim is always true and the, and the, and the complement is always false. I'm just saying if one is true, the other one has to be false, okay? That's all I'm saying there. So if one is false, then the other must be true. Okay, the other must be true. 
So these two hypotheses have a name, and we're going to use this the rest of the semester. First one, let's do blue. Okay, the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis, I call this H naught. H naught. Okay, that's how you read it, H naught. Now sometimes I call this the ho, okay, just because it's H O, the ho, all right? This is the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is a statistical hypothesis that contains a statement of equality. When you see equality, what do you think? You should think things like less than or equal to. If it has equality in it, it's part of the hoe. It's the, it's the null hypothesis. I, another thing that has an equal sign in it is greater than or equal to. And of course, the last thing is the equal to, okay? Now, what is the opposite, all right? So I have the null, the opposite. Remember, it's a complement, right? So we've got the complement. So the alternative, you have one option and an alternative, okay? So you've got the null and the alternative hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis is HA. HA, alternative A. I call this the ha. Okay, so I've got I've got the ho and I've got the ha. Alright? So the ha is the complement of the null hypothesis. What is the opposite of less than or equal to? It's strictly greater than. Okay? What is the opposite of um, greater than or equal to, it's strictly less than. What is the opposite of equal to? It's not equal to, okay? So you're doing the exact opposite, the opposite, the opposite, and the opposite here. I wrote them in order to kind of help you make them line up like that, okay? Now, one thing I want you to note, right, and not get caught up on, and this is important, the claim. So what did we claim here? We claim that this particular model was more than eight hours. That's the claim that the company is making. The claim can be the null or the alternative hypothesis. Okay, I don't, some people get all caught up and they think, okay, the claim is always going to be the alternative or the claim will always be the null. No, the claim can be either one of those, all right? So how do we identify what the null is, what the alternative is? This is what you have to remember. The null Hypothesis is the one with the equal sign. If you see an equal sign, that's the ho. All right? That's how you're going to remember it. The, the ho is equal. If you got some type of equals in it, that's the one that's the ho. And if you're not the ho, you're the ha. Okay? So here's the original claim again. You don't have to rewrite it. If you don't want to, you can just have an arrow coming down to it. The original claim, a cell phone company claims that the main life of a battery for a particular model is more than eight hours. So your question, write the null and the alternative and label the claim. Write the null and the alternative and label the claim. So how do I do this? How do I do it? All right, the null... The null, what do we say? The null is the hoe. So that's the hoe right there. Okay? So the null hypothesis, H naught, this is going to be what? This is the one that has the equal sign in it. So we need to figure out, we need to figure out, you know, what is the equal sign? What is not, you know, what's the other one? The alternative right here. 
So we've got to come up with a inequality that's going to represent this in math. Okay? So how do I do that? Well, what am I saying here? Okay, this needs to say mean. I don't know why that says. So the mean life. When I see the mean, the word mean in here, this is going to be, I think, of mu. Okay, mean, I think mu. All right? It says the mean life of the model is more than eight. So more than eight, that means the mean is greater than eight. Can it be equal to eight? No, it's more than eight. All right? So when I'm talking about my two claims, okay, one represents the claim and one is the complement, it's the opposite. So here's the claim. The claim that the company is making is that the mean battery life is greater than eight. What is the opposite of being greater than eight? The opposite, the, the opposite here is mu less than or equal to eight, okay? So that's the opposite. Now, which one is the ho and which one is the ha? The ho has the equals in it. So I put mu, let me do it in blue. So I've got my answer here. Mu less than or equal to eight. And the ha, the ha has to be the other one. It's mu greater than eight. And then I'm gonna put over to the side here, the claim. I'm gonna label my claim. So my answer, I'm gonna highlight it here for you. This is what I'm looking for, all right? This is what you'll be putting in, all right? So mu is less than or equal to eight, and mu greater than eight, that's the ha. Okay, so this next problem, you're asked to find the complement of each and then graph on a number line, okay? So I want you to identify the null and the alternative. So this first one here, the opposite, the complement of being greater than two is being less than or equal to two, okay? So which one is the ho, which one is the ha? The ho has the equal, so I'm gonna put the ho here, and the ha, the ha does not have the equals, okay? So that's right there. So it says graph the claim. All right, graph the claim on the number line, the claim, here is what's written. These are my claims. Okay. So here the claim is the ha. It's the one with the equals. So so the claim is your alternative here. Um, if I graph this, so say I, say I graph this on a number line. What number is important? The number two pops up in both of them. So make sure you have two on your number line. How do I graph something that is greater than two? Okay, to graph that, I'm gonna do black. Okay, this is an open circle here. Now, what you might have going on instead of an open circle, because this is kind of like a high school thing, right? Instead of being an open circle, they might do a parenthesis and then a two like this. Why are they doing this? This is a college algebra thing. What's going on here is I'm saying all numbers that are greater than two. So in interval notation, this looks like two to infinity. Y'all see how I have a parenthesis there? It would be a bracket if it was included, if it had the equal underneath, all right? On the other side, on the other side, what's going on, it's less than or equal to two. So technically, what's going on is I'm solid dotting and I'm going to the left, okay? I want all numbers that are less than or equal to two. Those are numbers to the left of two. Now, what you might see in your homework is a little bracket just like this. And the reason it's written like this, well, I'm going as far as I can that way, that's to negative infinity. I never get there, that's why I put the parenthesis. And then I go up to two, but I actually touch two right there, so I put a bracket here. So those are the interval notations, all right? If they just ask you to graph it, what they're really looking for is Just this 
part right here. Let me pick this up just like that. So that's that's kind of what it's going to look like for you, okay? Actually, let me move that down there. All right. So this is this is the graph. Okay. Let's do another one. So p less than 3. The opposite of p less than 3 is p greater than or equal to 3. Which one's the hoe? It's the one with the equals. So the hoe is this one down here. All right? If that's the hoe, this has got to be the ha. Okay? So the ha, the alternative is the claim again. That's fine. Okay, the alternative was the claim for both of those. If I graph it, the number that looks like it's important is 3 here. So I'm going to put a mark for 3. So the hoe is p greater than or equal to, so I put a bracket and I go this way. And so that's the ho, so label it HO. Now the ha, the ha is strictly less than, and one thing that might help you out is if your variable is first and then you have your number, the inequality tells you which way to go. I'm going which way? To the left, okay? So I'll put my parentheses, because I don't touch three, I just get really close, and that's the ha over on that side, okay? This last one here, now this says sigma equals four, okay? That's the claim. Now, what did we say? The ho was equal sign. So the ho here is sigma equal to four. What's the opposite of being equal to four? Not being equal to four, okay? That's the ha. All right, so here is an example where the ho is the claim. The first two, the ha was the claim. So the claim can be the null, but it could also be the alternative. So it's not one or the other all the time. It just depends on how the problem is written. So what do we have here? How do I graph this? The ho is only true at four. So the ho is this right here, that's the hoe. It's a dot, a single dot at four, okay? Not that big. Now the ha is everything else. What's everything else? Everything going this way and everything going this way. What's the only thing we leave out? We can't have it equal to four, so we put a circle right here at four. So how do I graph that? You got going this way and you got going this way, so the ha is everywhere except for where the hoe is. Okay? All right, cool. So, now we're going to talk about the mechanics behind proof by contradiction. Proof by contradiction is one of the most powerful ways to prove something to be true. Okay? One of the most powerful ways to prove something is true. No matter which hypothesis test or which hypothesis represents the claim, okay, we always start by assuming the null hypothesis is true. Okay? We always start by assuming The null hypothesis is true. Okay, how does this relate to our justice system, right? How does this relate to the legal system, right? So we always start by assuming the person being accused of the crime is innocent, all right? We always, we always start by assuming that they are innocent, okay? So 
So let's run through all the different steps for the hypothesis test, okay? We start by assuming the null hypothesis is true. We go out and we get evidence. We draw evidence. Okay, how do we draw evidence? From a sample, a sample is where we get our evidence. We go out and we get a sample. Our evidence could be n, it could be x bar, s, s squared, p hat, all these things that we're gonna talk about. Okay, those are sample statistics. We go out and we draw this from the population. Okay, and then the last step, the last step says, see if the evidence contradicts the HO, H naught. If it does contradict it, then what do we do? What do we do if it does contradict it? I reject the HO. I reject the null hypothesis. Okay. And you can either reject it or you can fail to reject it. Or there does not, so it does not contradict your original assumption. Okay, and if it does not contradict, then the only thing that you can do is fail to reject the null hypothesis. Okay? So how does our justice system work? All right, how does the justice system work? So let's think about this for just a second. All right? So what's going on here? Well, first, okay, there is a carefully worded accusation, all right? They come and they say, Your Honor, we believe Mr. Clark is a lying thief, all right? He came in and he stole some blackboard markers, all right? And some chalk. It's hard out here for a teacher. And, uh, and they just, you know, we can't say just because it's hard that it's okay to go around stealing markers and chalk. So, we're going to provide some evidence. Okay, so they, so they come out and they say, this is what we're charging against them. But what is the jury told to do? They're told to assume, assume innocent, okay? So assume that they're innocent until they bring enough information, okay? They provide the jury with all of this evidence, okay? They go out. And they, and they provide the jury with evidence. You know, maybe the evidence is, um, you know, Mr. Clark has chalk dust on his hands. So chalk. So there's chalk dust in his car. You know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> right? There's, you know, there's videotape. with him walking out of the school and he's got chalk in his hand, right? He's, there's all this evidence that they've drawn from their sample. Can they get all of the evidence that there is total? No, but they can get a huge percentage of the population, okay? the population being all the evidence possible. The sample is just everything that they go out and they gather. And then, okay, so the original assumption was innocence, right? Well, if you go out and you get all of this evidence here, 
it's going to be pretty hard to say that my original assumption was true. So, so if there's enough evidence to show um, that the that the original assumption of being innocent is false, then we say, by golly, that person is guilty. Okay? But if the evidence is not strong enough, what happens to Mr. Clark? There's no conviction. There is no conviction. Now, does this mean that Mr. Clark was innocent? Maybe, maybe not though. Just because I didn't get convicted doesn't mean I didn't do it, right? So we don't say when we fail to reject, we don't say that you're innocent. We just say there wasn't enough information to prove that you're guilty. So it's very important to understand this phraseology here fail to reject instead of saying that we accept. We just fail to reject, okay? So you can do one of two things, test question. You can either reject the null or you can fail to reject the null, okay? So either there is not strong enough evidence and to support that there's a conviction or there is enough evidence, okay, enough evidence to reject innocence, which means that you're guilty, okay? If there's videotape of me walking in and then walking out and I stole chalk and stuff. It's pretty hard to say, well, I just didn't know, right? It's evidence. I'm literally walking out with it. That's enough evidence probably to go beyond a reasonable doubt that I committed the crime, okay? So you have to remember you're making a decision that's the decision is based on a sample, okay? We don't have all of the evidence total. There's no way to get 100% of the evidence unless you were there yourself while you were committing the crime, right? Who done it? Unless you were there holding the flashlight, you don't know for sure. Okay, you can't be 100% sure. Can we be 99.999? Sure. But we can't get all of it. So you have to remember you're making a decision based on the sample and not the whole population. And because it's not the whole population, there is always a possibility of making a wrong decision. So there's a possibility that you can make a wrong decision. Is our justice system perfect? Absolutely not. It is not perfect. However, it's the best one that we have. It's the best justice system we have, okay? You can never be 100% sure unless you sample the entire population. So the only way you can be 100% sure is if entire population is tested. This is just basically impossible to do, all right? Or it's very expensive and time consuming to do this. So you're opening yourself up to making a wrong decision. Are there people that get sent to jail or prison that are innocent? Absolutely. Are there people that walk away and they committed the crime, but they there wasn't enough evidence to prove that they committed it, and they walk away scot-free? Yeah, it happens. Wrong decisions happen every day, okay? So here are the possible wrong decisions. You can have a type one error. The type one error, also known as alpha, 
We're going to use alpha the rest of the semester. Alpha type 1 error. So if they tell you an alpha, this is a type 1 error. This occurs if the null is rejected when it was actually true. So the null is rejected when it was true. Okay? The null is the null hypothesis. That's the ho. Okay? A beta error. This is a type... Two error. This is going to happen if the null is not rejected. We fail to reject. The hoe when it was actually false. OK, when it was not telling the truth. All right. So maybe we can draw the parallels again here. So I'll give you a chance to write this down here. Okay. So the truth, we're going to start over here with our hypothesis testing. Okay. Now you have a decision. Your decision is in black. There's two things that you can do. You can either reject the hoe or you can fail to reject the hoe. That's it. That's all you can do. Now, if the hoe is true, but you reject the hoe, you say, hoe, you are false. That is an error. Don't reject a true hoe, right? So type one error. This is when I reject the hoe but the hoe was true. That's a type one error. That's alpha. All right. Now, if the hoe is false, if the hoe's telling a lie and you reject the hoe, that's a good thing. If the hoe's lying, you want to reject it. Okay. The second scenario, the second scenario is fail to reject. Now, if the hoe is true and I fail to reject the hoe, that's a good thing, all right? That's a good thing. If I fail to reject the hoe when the hoe is not lying, it's true, okay? That's what we want. But if I fail to reject the hoe and the hoe is lying, then now I'm gonna be with a lying, a lying hoe, right? So that's bad. I want to reject that. So that is a type 2 error. That's your beta mistake. If you you if the hoe is false, if the null is false, then I want to um fail then I want then what is what's going on here? Sorry guys, let me back up. If if the hoe is false, and I fail to reject the hoe, that's an error, okay? If the hoe is false, I want to reject the hoe, okay? So, how do we do this in the justice system? With the justice system, the legal system, what are the decisions being made by the jury? They either deliver a guilty verdict or they deliver a not guilty verdict. All right, so if the person is innocent, if the hoe's telling the truth, right, and they're innocent, and I say that they're guilty, that's a bad thing, all right? I don't want to send an innocent person, so the person here, if they're innocent and the jury delivers a guilty verdict, that's an error, that's a type one error. That's alpha. Okay. Now, if the person is guilty, if they're guilty and the jury delivers a guilty verdict, that's good. We want guilty people to go to prison. That's justice. Justice.
okay? However, on the flip side, if your person is innocent, okay? If your person is innocent and then the jury says, not guilty, your honor, that's justice again, okay? That's a good thing. If somebody's innocent and a not guilty verdict is delivered, we want that to happen, right? But what's bad is when a guilty person gets delivered a not guilty verdict, right? That's another injustice. That's a type two error, okay? Now, there's two ways to make a mistake, either type one or type two, okay? Either you send an innocent person to jail or you let a guilty person go, all right? And the problem with this scenario, okay, the problem with this scenario is that they are inversely related errors, okay? So what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, before I get too much into that, let me just write down a little trick that's going to help you remember um, your type 1 and type 2, okay? So type 1 alpha is rejecting when I shouldn't. Okay, type two error this is failing to reject when I should okay so so this is as concisely as I can explain it an error, alpha error, type one, reject when you shouldn't. Type two, fail to reject when you should reject. Okay? So, how, how do these errors relate in the justice system? Okay? Um, what's worse might be the question. Would you rather an innocent person go to jail or would you rather a guilty person go free? Okay, that's a that's a moral question right there. Which one would you rather do? Because they're both mistakes, right? Is it better to send somebody to jail for the rest of their life to prison and they were really innocent? Or is it better to let somebody who deserves to be in prison the rest of their life walk free, which one is better, right? So the way our justice system is set up, we try to prevent sending innocent people to jail, okay? So the justice system has said that it's worse to convict an innocent person, okay? So that means that we want to make our alpha error small. But in an effort to make alpha small, this is worse than not convicting a guilty person. Okay? That makes the guilty, somebody not convicting a guilty person, larger. Okay? So... Why does this happen? Because what we say is we don't just say, hey, go out there and get enough evidence, and then hopefully there's enough evidence to show that they're guilty. We say guilty, you know, there's enough evidence beyond a reasonable doubt A reasonable doubt. Okay? What does that mean? That means there's... I mean, you got the guy on video camera committing the crime, right? Beyond a reasonable a reasonable doubt they committed the crime. This means that the chance of convicting someone who didn't 
commit the crime is really small. It's beyond a reasonable doubt that you're right and that you're not going to make that error. But the problem with that is that's a high bar for the for the people prosecuting to try to leap over to prove somebody's guilty. Since it's hard to prove somebody's guilty, right? That means there's a better chance that a guilty person is going to walk away scot-free, okay? So you have to be careful here, all right? Our justice system has leaned towards protecting against sending innocent people to prison. And therefore, a lot of people who are really guilty, who committed the crime, walk away um, without um, going to prison, okay? So to show you this in a picture, all right? So here is a picture for you how this works. Okay, so I'm going to draw two normal curves. Here's one normal curve where the hoe is true. Now the hoe, the hoe, okay, and then I got the ha. Over here, the ha. This is where the ho is false. Okay? Ho is true, ho is false. All right. Now, let's think about our example that we had at the first of class. We had a cell phone company that made the claim that their battery life was greater than eight hours. It was more than eight hours. That was the claim, right? That was the ha. The ho was mu less than or equal to eight. Okay. So here's what we do. We assume what? We assume the ho is true. We start by assuming the ho's not a liar. So if the ho is true, that means my mean is equal to eight. Okay, so the, the mean of the hoe is eight. All right? Now, what I think is probably true is the ha. The claim is greater than eight. So my, my mean of the ha is larger. It's on this side. Okay? So we go out, we gather evidence. We go out, maybe we go up and we get, you know, 30 cell phones. And we test the battery life of each of those cell phones. And we find some sample average, right? Some sample average. Maybe it's like, I don't know, 9.5, whatever. 9.5 hours is what we found. So we find some X bar. Okay, we've got some critical X bar value. Okay, this is my critical value. All right, that's when I go out and I gather my evidence. Now the question becomes, okay, did the X bar, did it come from the black distribution? Okay, if it did, then that means the probability that it did not would be alpha, this shaded region, that black shaded region right there. Okay, something greater than, right? Now, the beta would be this probability, this shaded area right here, okay? So this critical value, this critical value, everything in this region, okay, if we fall 
over here, we fail to reject the hoe. So maybe this is my critical value that I've set up right here, and I've decided, okay, if I get an X bar that falls over here, maybe my X bar is in here, there's not enough evidence to say that this hoe right here is lying, okay? Therefore, I fail to reject the hoe. I fell in this region. But if I get an X bar like over here, okay? If I get an X bar over here, maybe my X bar is like 10 or something, I don't know. Um, then over here, if I fall in this region, it's more likely that my true um, distribution lies somewhere greater than having a mean of eight, okay? So I reject the original hoe curve over here and I go with my alternative hypothesis, okay? So I reject the innocent, and I say there's enough evidence to show that they're guilty, right? Okay, there. So that potential error that I run into, my alpha as I move, so as I move this critical value, that shaded region changes with it, okay? So right there, it looks like my alpha is pretty big and my beta is pretty small. But if I move my critical bar over here, all right, look, the further away I get from the mean, the more I have to be sure, like if I get an X bar out here, it's like beyond reasonable doubt, my gosh, the average is like 20 hours. I'm pretty sure that's greater than eight hours, okay? So the smaller my alpha is, the stronger my beyond my reasonable doubt becomes. That's why I have a small alpha here, all right? That's what's going on there. But if you have a small alpha, what does that do? That makes your beta a whole heck of a lot larger. So you end up having a lot more guilty people walking away not getting convicted okay so i know i know it's kind of a lot to take in um, but hopefully that little picture helped out all right i'm going to cut this video in half now and we'll start up with level of significance